Good morning, everyone. I just want to make a little uh, change of pace, and uh, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, the idea of the public sphere in the works of the German historian and philosopher Jürgen Habermas. This is, like I say, a bit of a change of pace and uh, will really stand a little, a little bit of an odd way in the middle of all the technical uh, material that you are trying to grasp. I still want you to pay attention to this because our conception of what it means to do digital history should be mediated by our understanding of of how technical infrastructure affects what can be said in a fundamentally historical manner. So um, so it will feel like a little bit of a like a step back, maybe ten or twenty or thirty levels step back, but um, but please pay attention nonetheless. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about the public sphere, and we'll talk about uh, the way in which Habermas' Moss's conception of the public sphere has affected conversations about the nature of the internet uh, in the years since um, since Habermas uh, first develop this idea. So the uh, the title of the um, of the uh, of the lecture is what the web signifies. Um, uh, we can say um, we can identify at least two different senses of that term. We can ask, what matters about the web? What's the significance of the web? Or we can talk not about significance, but about signification. How does the web create and change meaning? Uh, and, and we mean both of those, maybe, today. Um, in terms of what matters about the web, the web has obviously had tremendous effects. There have been tremendous economic effects of the, the World Wide Web. I mean, Amazon is perhaps one. Uh, striking example. Um, there have been tremendous political effects. Uh, Donald Trump is perhaps uh, an example. Um, and obviously enormous cultural uh, ramifications. We live, eat, and breathe through the internet in a way that was unimaginable, say, for someone like me in the 1980s. Um, but what I want to talk about is not the economic, political, and cultural effects strictly speaking, but instead about the discursive effects. That is, how does the web change the kinds of conversations that we can have? And does it do so for the better or for the worse? Um, the, another way to say this is, is to ask, what are the peculiar technical affordances of this technological system? What uh, characteristics does the technological system have that enables certain kinds of conversations more easily and uh, makes other kinds of conversations more difficult to have. And how does that mirror earlier developments in the history of media? To, to address this question, I want to back way up and talk about the concept of the public sphere, which is a phrase, of course, you've heard and uh, which, uh, although is perhaps a little bit less common than it was at its peak, um, is part of common parlance, um, but has a technical meaning in the works of Jürgen Habermas. Habermas was a preeminent German intellectual in the 1960s and 1970s, and is, uh, is still alive today, um, has had an active intellectual career for uh, over 60 years. Um, as a post-war German intellectual, really the first prominent post-war German kind of multidisciplinary public intellectual, he's deeply influenced by German history in, in mid-century, that is to say uh, fascism, and the Holocaust. And he is a, a student of the um, uh, of what's known as the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurter Schule, um, a, uh, a school of thought um, 
<coughs> heavily influenced by Marxism, but which tried to step away from what it sometimes described as dogmatic Marxist thought. Uh, and much of his work, uh, especially his philosophical work, is structured around the search for authentic forms of communication. Um, and the, the historical work, in a way, is a, an his, a historical excavation aimed at uh, uh, organizing some philosophical thinking. And in part, that's because in the Frankfurt School, philosophical and historical thinking were very tightly bound together. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the background of German history at this moment in time. Um, uh, what we're seeing in the mid-century, so in the pre-war and post-war period, is a very interesting time in the history of media, uh, in some ways mirroring our own time, in that uh, a variety of new media have appeared. We have uh, the rise of radio, and then uh, not long after the rise of television, and also new kinds of glossy magazines that hadn't been possible to make in uh, with previously existing printing technology, uh, so uh, with vivid colors and so forth. Um, the question that Habermas is really really wants to ask is, are these new media degraded uh, uh, and less authentic? than the media that came before them. Do they make us stupider? Do they make us less critical? Do they make us more pliable? And uh, Habermas, of course, writing in Germany just after the war, has plenty of reasons to worry about these questions uh, with the extremely adept uh, deployment by the Nazi regime of the new media, whether it was radio, in, uh, in the broadcast of official addresses by uh, Hitler and Goebbels and other uh, major figures in the Nazi party, or whether it was uh, the use of film as a propaganda medium. Uh, uh, here, a poster from an anti a prominent anti-Semitic film from 1940. Um, and, and, of course, uh, there are lots of ways in which one might conceive this, and Habermas's innovation, as it were, is to is to ask whether the technologies of transmission themselves uh, somehow helped played a strong role in making these kinds of um, uh, these kinds of pronouncements possible. So maybe the media of communication are a, a sort of underlying material condition that make Nazi evil possible. In order to ask that question about the present, he frames a set of philosophical propositions and then goes back to investigate their development in the past. Uh, and it's worth pausing for a moment to, to recognize that the phrase public sphere for Habermas is a technical term and it may not mean exactly what you think it means. So let's read it out loud from the uh, encyclopedia article which you uh, have in your reading uh, on the syllabus. By the public sphere we mean, writes Habermas, a realm of our social life in which something approaching public opinion can be formed and public opinions may be a difficult phrase here, uh, is somewhere between the way that we use the phrase and the way that the um, that French intellectuals of the 18th century talked about the general will. So some kind of uh, collective consensus. A realm of our social life in which something approaching public opinion can be formed. Citizens behave as a public body in this technical sense when they confer in an unrestricted fashion, that is, with the guarantee of freedom of assembly and association and the freedom to express and publish their opinions about matters of general interest. So some key uh, sub phrases here, public body, an unrestricted fashion, matters of general interest. 
uh, and unpacking that is going to be some uh, not a trivial task. Uh, the the words public and private in our uh, you know ordinary discourse uh, have lots of meanings. Here is a list of some of them. You can pause the, the slides if you want and take a look at some of them and think about them. But uh, in uh, in Habermas, the um, the concept of the public sphere refers to an arena that is ruled by rational argument in which freedom of expression prevails in unrestricted fashion uh, and the conversations concern common interests uh, that is which is um, a phrase that that Habermas does not fully unpack but here he means really uh, matters that are that rise above individual interest so you and I may both be interested in uh, you know the sexy jeans that we wear but that does not constitute a conversation about what what Habermas is calling a common interest here he means matters of uh, uh, of law matters of politics matters of philosophy and matters of aesthetics uh, which he thinks rise above the individual level to be of general interest. This notion of the public sphere is for Habermas both ideal and historical at the same time. It is a, a, a philosophical ideal. We, could, we can imagine a, a perfect public sphere in a kind of platonic manner, but it is also something that was historically realized really in the 18th century. Uh, uh, r arising in the 18th century in Europe and flourishing for a brief time and then withering by the end of the 19th century and reaching a kind of a low point in the 20th century. And the question that he has in the 1960s is whether the public sphere can be revived. And I think that it remains kind of uh, an open question for us in the 21st. For Habermas, again, influenced by, like the rest of the Frankfurt School, by Marxist thought, um, the, uh, the public sphere is a phenomenon that arises with the development of bourgeois society in uh, early capitalism. Uh, before bourgeois society, there is no public sphere, according uh, to Habermas, and he... Uh, presents some interesting textual evidence to this effect. Instead, uh, in uh, European discourse of that period, there are public individuals that have certain powers distinguished from private persons. So there are public individuals and church authorities who are empowered to speak on moral matters, uh, whereas other persons are simply characterized as private persons. And we see this very interestingly in a speech of Frederick the Great of Prussia, this speech is from 1784 uh, in uh, the announcement of a major censorship law. He says, uh, in, in which uh, uh, he uh, lays down restrictions on what ordinary people can say about uh, political decisions. A private person has no right to pass public and perhaps even disapproving judgment on the actions, procedures, laws, regulations, and ordinances of sovereigns and courts, or to publish and print pertinent reports that he manages to obtain. For a private person is not at all capable of making such judgment because he lacks complete knowledge of circumstances and motives. And so instead of a private sphere and a public sphere, we have private and public persons who are distinguished one from the other. Um, and Habermas's historical question is, how do we get from a monarchy in which only public persons have a license to speak on public matters to a public sphere which is more widely open? And Habermas's answer is that this is made possible by the rise of two kinds of institutions. First, print media, newspapers and journals, in which um, private commentary on public matters becomes more and more widespread. And so and we can see this 
these media as a technological innovation. Then along with this, uh, and in fact, uh, largely dependent on the rise of newspapers and journals, is the rise of a new kind of sociality, in particular salons and coffee houses. And these are images of coffee houses from the late 18th, uh, from the 17th and 18th centuries. Coffee houses are an interesting historical phenomenon, which I, I guess I won't go into too deeply here, uh, except to say that um, coffee and its uh, uh, and the availability of artificial stimulants uh, dramatically changed European culture in uh, in the kind of what we might think of as the early imperial period after the uh, uh, European exploration and conquest of the New World. Um, although coffee itself is an old world plant. Um, anyway, in, in especially the France and uh, uh, governments in, influenced by France, salons emerged in the, in the mid 18th century as the heart of intellectual activity. Uh, so many of the famous philosophical works that you may be familiar with, the works of Voltaire and Rousseau, are first discussed, published in, um, in salons, uh, especially in Paris. These were interesting spaces which were uh, generally run by people of, um, of, uh, from the no nobility, um, especially uh, often by women, which is, I think, very interesting uh, uh, development in um, in the history of gender in in Europe, um, but one uh, feature of the salon was that they were not restricted only to the nobility, and instead that, that there was a mixing of classes. Uh, often, the philosophers and artists who uh, presented at at these salons were not wealthy people, even. So uh, not only non-noble, but um, not from the upper crust of the emergent bourgeoisie. Uh, and there was a, a kind of intellectual freedom in salons, which was not exactly this, which was distinct from the relationship of patronage, which had preceded them. Coffee houses were a similar space, uh, but whereas the salons, uh, place strict restrictions on the discussion, for instance, of political matters. Uh, coffee houses, uh, which did not, which were not private homes, but instead uh, related to the old tradition of the of the public house, um, placed no such restrictions on discourse, <clears throat> and matters of politics were as frequent a topic as as art, and here we see people stridently discussing um, matters of public interest in the coffee house. And you, you can see that, that this, uh, this vision of the coffee house is somewhat more robust than what we think of the coffee house as doing today. Although even today in Toronto, for instance, in a non-COVID era, the coffee house remains a uh, a lively, or some coffee houses remain a lively uh, 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 setting for public conversation. Um, Habermas argues that, especially in the coffee houses, an ideal of common humanity reigns in which opinions that are expressed are judged by reason alone. and. As a result, there is no intrusion in the coffee houses uh, and to a lesser extent in newspapers and journals of distinction or of financial status. Um, and so these become a kind of model for uh, a way in which public conversation can take place, not judged by social distinction, but instead by uh, merely by the... Um, uh, the content of argument. Of course, one might look at these pictures and note that uh, that there are clearly still some restrictions on who can speak. Uh, we're looking at pictures entirely of men, and even in the 17th and 18th century, it is notable that everyone in the coffee house is uh, is white. 
uh, and because because even in the 18th century, um, uh, European society was not monolithically uh, white, but instead, uh, you know, um, populated by persons uh, whose origin was from from the um, imperial holdings of the European powers. Um, so, so though it, it, it's really important here as a footnote, which we'll come back to at the end of the lecture, uh, to recognize that Habermas's idealization of this period elides, uh, makes it harder for us to see the um, the restrictions that were uh, that were in place in these places. Um, so the um, the Habermasian vision uh, and the kind of the kind of conversation that took place in coffee houses was important for uh, for local conversations, but uh, in order for conversations to take place across geographical areas. Uh, something more than face-to-face -face conversation was needed. You need a way to get ideas to large numbers of people. And here we have these very interesting developments in the history of print media. Uh, there had been in prior eras uh, publications called news sheets, often a single sheet of paper broadsheets, sometimes called, uh, with local information. These give rise, uh, give way to, to a, a newer form of publication called, which we think of as the newspaper, um, longer, uh, addressing questions of more general interest, and with wider circulation across uh, time and space. Also, you have uh, out of a tradition of um, of public letters, for instance, that scholars, natural philosophers, or other philosophers might uh, might write and copy to large numbers of their colleagues. Those uh, public letters are replaced by um, by technical journals, uh, new publication medium uh, mediated by some kind of a publishing house. Uh, that accepted submissions, and you see these journals arising in the 18th century in large numbers uh, uh, on questions of art, politics, and central philosophy. Um, the, uh, the rise of these media is made possible through the transformation of economic forms in the 18th century. Uh, through newspapers and journals, conversation becomes not merely an experience, but also a commodity, something that can be bought and sold. In the 18th century, this is a really important and salutary, that is to say, positive development. Uh, because conversation is a commodity, it is no longer exclusive. Anybody with money to buy a journal can, can participate in the conversation. So because it, uh, it reduces exclusivity, commodification in the beginning of this process is absolutely positive and makes the public sphere as we, ha as we, we uh, have experienced it possible. Um, all of this is taking place mostly in a pre-democratic era. The people are, for the state, a, a fundamentally a problem. They're an issue uh, uh, that the state has to, has to grapple with. The, this growth, then, of the social sphere is a, a threat to sovereignty. As a result, the public sphere, as I'm discussing it here, is precarious and subject to dissolution. The public sphere sits between private life and authority, and it mediates bes between them, drawing its legitimacy from the use of reason. Note that this conception presupposes an emergent realm of privacy, so that it is grounded in that notion, the notion of private life, as all liberal philosophical constructs are starting in the 18th century. Um, 
the the life cycle of the public sphere, as Habermas describes it, is as follows. In effect, the public sphere undoes itself. And this is a, a, a common Marxist trope or a Marxist way of thinking about things that uh, in, in dialectics, a phenomenon emerges, develops, and then its own internal development uh, leads to its undoing. So, for instance, in the Marxist conception of of history more broadly, uh, the uh, the development of the forces of production leads to a development of a, a of a, um, a set of relations of production, say serfdom, and uh, those relations for a a, a time a, a certain length of time. Uh, allow the forces of production to continue to develop until through that the development the force of production becomes so powerful that they are no longer compatible with the old mode of production and so serfdom undoes itself. Uh, capitalism develops the force of production and then it brings about its own destruction in the universal revolution of communism. Um, we see here the same mode of thinking uh, where the public sphere develops, but its own success leads to its destruction. The success of media, the success of, of the media system that I just described, dissolves the reciprocal creation and communication of ideas. B media becomes so powerful that instead of producing, we become merely consumers, the vast majority of us. And, uh, and reason, which at first motivated the, um, the development of the public sphere, begins to vanish from the media as other uh, forms of expression come to dominate. <clears throat> we see this happening already, according to Habermas, by the mid 19th century in the newspaper system. Um, and uh, it becomes even more pronounced in the 20th century with the massive growth of radio, television, and film. So Habermas looks at the public sphere that he has inherited and says this is a hollow shell. It lacks legitimacy. It, no longer, uh, uh, it can no longer say we do the work of preserving rational discourse on matters of of common interest. Instead, uh, uh, we um, we distract and detain uh, masses of people uh, with matters of of um, with matters that don't matter, as it were. Now, this idea, which Habermas first put forward in 1962, in uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, a book called The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, uh, Strukturwandel der Öffentlichkeit in German. This idea is extremely influential, but there are some questions about both the historical and the philosophical elements of the story. Um, one of the most kind of prominent and uh, relevant salient critiques uh, comes from Mark War Warner in 2002, uh, in which Warner says that this idea that there's a single public sphere in which uh, people come together, as it were, cut off from their uh, from their social positions, and that that's the only public sphere that matters, uh, misses important elements of collective conversation. Uh, first, the public may not be unified. And second, the idea that we need to cut ourselves off from the conditions that have made us who we are in order to be able to speak uh, misses the fact that our specific circumstances give us relevant perspectives on matters that, on issues that matter to us. <clears throat>
Um, and so Warner develops this idea of counterpublics, uh, which when he publishes it, he um, associates uh, with new developments that are happening in the internet. Uh, this is kind of the early days of the World Wide Web. He says, some publics are defined by their tension with a larger public. Discussion with such a public is understood to contravene the rules obtaining in the world at large. This kind of public is, in effect, a counter-public. It maintains at some level an awareness of its subordinate status. Here, Warner is particularly concerned with the uh, development of um, of uh, queer discourses in uh, North America uh, and the way in which a lived experience of um, of, of oppressed I don't know what to say repressed but of oppressed sexuality um, uh, helps people uh, to form ideas which are at least for a time acceptable only within this counter public and without that uh, uh, contained counter public discourse those ideas couldn't flourish because they'd be they'd be cut down by um, you know uh, um, um, would be cut down by by a kind of hegemonic opinion in the in the main public. So those these ideas can only thrive because they are constrained in their scope to this counter public. Um, Habermas sees the public sphere as necessarily unitary because uh, it is governed by a universal reason, but in reality, discourse carves out separate spaces that may correlate with social divides and importantly says Warner where the addressee is presumed to share a common subordinator with the speaker a common subordination um, uh, so so uh, if, if we you know Warner argues that um, the multiplicity of perspectives in you know, in, in society makes it difficult to define public opinion as a, as a single unit. And I think that one of the things that we see in Habermas is a remnant of an idea of the general will, really, from Rousseau, uh, that in w where he imagines that it's possible for the public to have an opinion, when in fact we have distinct spheres in which opinions are, are collectively shared by distinct, distinct social groups. Um, for Habermas, the separation of the individual from both official capacities and what he thinks of as accidental circumstances, say of birth or uh, you know anything to do with your body, the, that separation of the individual from both of those things, the official capacities and the accidental circumstances, is absolutely paramount in the in the uh, functioning of the public sphere. Warner says in response that this is fundamentally fictional, right? And even if it were achievable, it would be undesirable because some kinds of arguments are fundamentally corporeal. They have to do with your embodiment. And that doesn't make them less legitimate. I think one question for you as you go forward is, and kind of try to navigate this terrain is, who do you agree with? Do you agree with Habermas or with Warner on this point? Um, and, and, and another way in which Habermas and Warner uh, disagree with each other is, <clears throat> uh, is around what exactly it means to participate in the public sphere. For Habermas, the actions of a, pub a legitimate public sphere are actions of reading in which one scrutinizes, judges, and decides. In a counterpublic for Warner, there might be other sorts of actions, and he's thinking here again of, of gay counterculture in uh, North America, especially in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, and, and so actions that matter may include prancing, dissing, acting up, fantasizing, and mourning. Um, uh, 
so just let's think about uh, let's let's step back from that debate and ask how this matters for history if there are many publics then working to carve out a particular space for discourse can have really important effects uh, so it may sometimes be important to to uh, center your conversation within a community um, at the same time there might be modes of address and standards of comportment that can differ across publics uh, uh, or carry work from one public to another um, it might even be possible as historians to craft a public around our work though um, it follows and, and this is this is Warner here that the public exists only as long as the text is being engaged with and so that means that publics can come into being and then and then dissipate um, and so that's also worth thinking about as you as you uh, you know imagine the audience for your work um, Arbor Ross's theory revolves around the, you remember this in the 18th century two intertwined phenomena, a technological system and a set of social institutions. It was enabled by print and it was badly threatened by television. And one question at the turn of our century around 2000 was, was it possible for the internet to undo this dissolution? And if so, how would it happen? Uh, there was, and I remember having this feeling uh, around the time that you were born, that the internet had utopian possibilities that could bring the public sphere back to life by providing new opportunities for uncommodified speech um but uh that utopian framing of the internet has faded in the face of more recent developments developments you know that you can remember probably from say the Trump era or even uh, really the era of um, of Bush and Obama in the United States and, and and we have a kind of a countervailing an opposite question which is not can the internet save us but will the internet destroy us and and is it the the final stage in the dissolution of the of the public sphere these are questions that we that have yet to be answered and that we participate as it were in answering and, and we're asking here in this class does the internet provide a space for authentic public conversation and what are the effects of the medium on how we pursue knowledge and truth um, uh, in the internet of course there are massive pressures which are part of the technological affordances of the system there are state pressures there are corporate pressures there are also uh, non-human algorithmic actors which transform the way in which we experience our media um, the web provides instantaneous distribution just the possibility of distributed production of materials so uh, writing can take place anywhere um, it also provides machine readable text and as a result algorithmic sorting of information um, and and these technical affordances have some things in common with the media system that arose in the 18th and was transformed in the 19th century but they are also distinctive and uh, the question I suppose is what possibilities does something approaching a public sphere have when it is uh, when it is constrained by these technical affordances our takeaway is those are takeaway lessons are can we use this historical framework to make sense of the present and how can we engage with these technical affordances to to actively seek to create a public sphere that we might want to see in the world whether it's a kind of Habermasian or a Warnerian uh, public sphere uh, okay, and here are the sources. Um, there are a couple of things missing, and I will fix those for the version that goes online. Um, thank you, and uh, see you later in class to talk about HTML.